Welcome, church, to the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Sister Mary, for that delightful hymn. I hope you are ready to receive from the Lord this morning, church. We have the distinct privilege to welcome to the pulpit this morning. Uh, um, uh, what's that dude's name? You are now tuned in to the Sermon Archives of William R. Horn. Kingdom Dreamer Productions. (laughs) Welcome in to the Sermon Archives of William R. Horn, yours truly. Follow me on Twitter at William R. Horn, H-O-R-N-E. Today we got something a little different, a little change up. We're still in season one sermons of days past where we're kind of going through my hard drive of sermons I've done in the past, putting them in one collection. And then season two, we'll get to uh, current day sermons. So this one is actually technically not a sermon. It's uh, my bachelor's senior seminar presentation um, where I wrote about Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross and its implications on spiritual formation. Uh, So this one is far more academic and formal in nature. So if you're more academic in thought, you might enjoy it more. If you're not, you might not. But uh, an important work nonetheless, uh, something I'm even thinking more about uh, extending and doing more on as I think towards doctoral studies, this idea of the theology of the cross. Um, So yeah, Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross, Spiritual Formation, again, Kingdom Dreamers, we just opened up our Patreon page. You can support us and join the community for as little as $5 a month. Uh, Doing that helps support me in my ministry, the things I do uh, outside of my pastoral ministry. It also helps support the whole network of the Kingdom Dreamers, help us create more podcasts, uh, more writing, more content. Uh, If you join, all the different tiers have different rewards. Some of them have uh, different merch they send you. All of them you get invited into a discord community which is a a way for us to communicate kind of a community chat room and then there's different channels within that so a lot of good things happening a lot of great things we also have merch for sale kingdomdreamer.com check out the store got some shirts hats kind of depends on when you listen to it we release limited edition uh, merch that has a limited stock Um, so check it out support the movement but without further ado, which is a weird statement the more I say it, ado, I wonder what that means. Somebody, somebody tweeted me and tell me where that came from. But let's jump in. This is my Bachelor Senior Seminar Thesis. Uh, I didn't tell you the recording date. This is April 29, 2013. Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross in Spiritual Formation. I'd like to present to you Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross and its implication on spiritual formation. So my thesis is that for a Christian, Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross is a central lens for us to look through in order for us to have a proper knowledge of God and a rightly orientated pursuit of sanctification. My method for arguing this today will be to paint a clear picture of Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross through a portion of his work in the Heidelberg Disputation of 1518. Uh, This is where Martin Luther's Theology of the Cross becomes clear. And then after this picture is painted, I'd like to draw some somewhat radical spiritual implications from it. So I'd like to deal with seven theses from the Heidelberg Disputation to paint this picture. Shortly after Luther posted his 95 thesis, he was invited to do some more defining of this movement in the German Reformation before an Augustinian monastery in Heidelberg. He defended 40 theses, 28 of them being theological and 12 of them being philosophical. His theses 18 through 24 are where the theology of the cross and his opposing theology of glory become clear, and those are the ones that I'd like to deal with today. First, I want to define some terms before we get into the actual theses. Um, The theology of the cross we can consider a theology of revelation, meaning it is a focus on how we derive knowledge of God. So, by definition, theology is simply the study of God and this makes the theology of the cross a much bigger thing than just a chapter in theology, but it's actually a specific kind of theology. 
because we can't do theology without knowing where our knowledge of God comes from. Um, so, since Luther defines things this way, he divides theologians into two categories. You can be one, a theologian of glory, who looks for knowledge of God through speculation of the invisible attributes of God. Uh, we'll later define this as human wisdom and works of the law. Or two, you can be a theologian of the cross who looks for knowledge of God and the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this can be defined as God's visible self-revelation of himself in the person Jesus Christ. Church historian Roger Olson says it this way, which I think defines it well. He says, the theology of glory then is a human-centered theology that leads to an overestimation of natural human power and ability. The theology of the cross shows the true condition of humans as helpless sinners, alienated from God in mind and heart, and desperately in need of the rescue mission of the cross of Christ. So this gives us a better idea of where Luther was going, and we'll let his thesis define the rest of it. So I'd like to start with thesis 18, which states, It is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. This thesis would fall in the section on the will of man just before Luther actually talks about the theology of the cross versus the theology of glory. However, I find it important that we put this one first to paint this picture um, as Luther sets up his audience to actually hear his claim for the theology of the cross, that we must be in utter despair of our abilities. We must understand our totally depraved state after the fall. Otherwise, we won't be able to accept the claims that Luther is going to bring to us. We're enslaved to sin, and all of our actions are evil by nature, or by a fallen nature. Luther claims we cannot truly receive God's grace until we are in complete disgust of ourselves. Some would say this is a little extreme, and it must be asked, what about the image of God? Is Luther forgetting this part of our humanity? I would argue he is not. We need to define the image of God as the stamp that is put on us that makes us unique, and also orientates us towards worship. Of course, there is some more depth to this, but this stamp doesn't change the sin that's in our life and how that affects us. Unfortunately, our sin has distorted our orientation towards worship, to worshiping ourselves and not the Creator. 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Marx said it this way. He said, man is orientated towards that for which he is determined, speaking about the image of God. Even when he sins, he cannot deny and conceal, but he or he said, he can't deny and conceal, but he cannot remove or destroy the fact that he is orientated in this way. Even as a sinner, he remains a creature of God, and therefore, whose being is orientated to be a covenant partner of God. I would then claim that Luther's claim is not extreme, but accurate to who we are. Even with this stamp of the image of God on us, we are of no power and are enslaved to sin. And we cannot truly accept that grace of God until we come to terms with our depravity. So this leads us to thesis 19. That person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. This is where our contemplation of who God is and where we derive knowledge from him begins. This thesis is the definition of what Luther will call a theologian of glory, who he says, is not even deserving of really being called a theologian. They're actually false. His argument, it comes from a passage in Romans, Romans 1, 20-22, which talks about God's invisible attributes being clearly evident to all creation. A theologian doesn't just merely recognize the things that are already obvious to all men and then speculate on them. Luther would say this is not the way to go about theology. He would say the invisible attributes of God are things like godliness, wisdom, justice, goodness, things like that. And we know those are things of God just by the world we live in. A theologian of glory seeks to find God through the wisdom of man and the works of the law by speculating further on these invisible attributes that are evident to us. And speculating further on this will just lead us down a path of foolish and vain thinking. God's invisible attributes are made known to us for our benefits, but we cannot see them in full. And this is evident through scriptures like Exodus 33, where Moses wants to see the glory of God, but he is not allowed to see it in full, or else he would die. 
This goes the same for us, just having the invisible attributes handed to us, but we can't see them further. So Luther would say, you're a fool to seek to challenge the hiddenness of God. The hiddenness of God is essential to Luther's theology. Karl Barth's statement, God is known by God and by God alone, fits this well. God is in control of his knowability. Nobody can know God except for himself and what he chooses to let others know. This means that man is relying upon God's choice of revelation and not their own speculations and thoughts. Outside of God's revelation, God is completely hidden from man and out of reach. A theologian of glory, however, would speculate on these invisible things that haven't been revealed to us, leading him down a path of falsehood, confusion, which leads to idolatry, creating his own God and not the actual God of this universe. If we understand God's hiddenness, we will orientate our life towards a life of faith and not sight, as you have to have faith to trust in something that is hidden. So the question now is, where is God revealed then? And this leads us to Thesis 20. Thesis 20 would say, he deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God, seen through the suffering and the cross. The answer to the question of where does God choose to reveal himself is actually under the opposite of his invisible attributes. God is revealed in the concealed human nature of Jesus Christ, which is seen as weak and foolishness to a theologian of glory. These things we never attribute to God. He is not a human. He does not suffer. He should not die. Therefore, God has chosen to reveal himself in an indirect, hidden revelation and man's preconceived notions about God are killed and replaced with the crucified Christ. This is the extreme claim that Luther is making. The wisdom of the wise has been put to shame, and the only way to recognize it is in the humility, shame, and suffering of Jesus Christ and the cross. And God's glory is hidden and doesn't come to full until resurrection. This is the vision that a theologian of the cross should have. God's revelation is hidden and this does three things for us, I like to say. First, it protects us from death, which we already saw out of Exodus 33. Second, it kills our pride, making us reliant upon God and faith in Christ. And third, it shows us who we are in relation to God as creatures, sinners, blind, and people of destiny to death. Therefore, to be a true theologian and to gain knowledge of God, we must refer to Jesus alone. A theologian of glory will look for glory in this life through the wisdom and law and his speculations upon God. But the theologian of the cross knows that, just like Jesus, glory doesn't come until after the resurrection. Jesus lived a life of suffering and servanthood and didn't seek glory and fame. But when he was rose from the dead, this is when his glory came. And this is the same for us. This is a, a pivotal point for us to understand, which we'll discuss a little bit later when we get to the spiritual formation side of it, that until the resurrection comes, our life is to be orientated towards suffering and humility. And now that both sides have been introduced, Luther goes to Thesis 21. Thesis 21 reads, A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the things what it actually is. This could be seen as the capstone to 19 and 20. And according to Luther, a real theologian comprehends God only through the visible revelation in the cross. This means that if you go outside of it, namely what the theologian of glory does, you are actually speaking falsehood and what you are doing is evil. You are calling the good things evil and the evil things good. This is an extreme claim, but it fits well here. When we use our own standard to measure God and not his choice of revealing himself to us, we are, in fact, doing an evil by misrepresenting God. We must see things how they actually are and not how we speculate them to be. This then gives us a very different view of God and a very different reference to how we are supposed to live life and be spiritually formed. We cannot live in an over-realized eschatology seeking to live in glory because the bride of Christ right now doesn't have that glory. But we live in suffering here in this world. And that won't come until the second coming. So while here on earth, we are to live in reference to suffering and death, just like Jesus Christ did in his life. This, but the resurrection gives us a hope and a power to endure that suffering right now, knowing that glory will come. 
in the future. We will examine more of this when we get the spiritual formation part of it. And Luther now continues to build on this by going to Thesis 22. Thesis 22 reads, The wisdom which sees the invisible things of God and works as perceived by man is completely puffed up, blinded, and hardened. This is the wisdom of the theologian of glory. His love for the pursuit of glory, wisdom, and power, and things opposite of the Christ lead him down a path of pointless pursuits. He is blinded and he's hardened to the depths of God's grace, but he's trusting in his own works. Luther says the remedy for curing a desire is, does not lie in satisfying it, but in extinguishing it. Man must not pursue the things he desires, but the opposite things which are in the cross. And this is where he will be truly satisfied. And this fits well with scriptures like Luke 9, 23 through 25, where Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for somebody to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their very self? Jesus commands a believer to do the opposite of the wisdom of the world and lose their life for Christ's sake instead of trying to hold on to it and save it. This is the beauty of the wisdom of God that makes a fool out of the wise and gives new light to what true spiritual formation actually looks like. Luther then goes to Thesis 23, which states that the law brings the wrath of God, kills, reviles, accuses, judges, and condemns everything that is not in Christ. So he takes it one step further and says that the theologian glory is actually under the wrath of God for looking outside of Christ. Luther develops his thesis from Paul's writings in Romans and Galatians, where it's written, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13. And for all who rely on works of the law are under the curse, Galatians 3.10. Further, the law brings wrath, found in Romans 4.15. And the very command which promised life proved to be death to me, Romans 2.12. These passages put the theologian of glory in a very confusing and dangerous place. Not only does the wisdom that he's boasting in and searching for God in harden him and blind him to God's true grace, but it also kills him and puts him under the wrath of God. So in light of Thesis 22 and 23, the question must be asked, what is to be said about wisdom and the law in general? This leads us to Luther's 24 Thesis, which reads, Yet that wisdom is not of itself evil, nor is the law to be invaded, but without the theology of the cross, man misuses the best in the worst manner. So Luther makes a clarifying point here that the law and wisdom are not evil within themselves, but when they're looked outside of the theology of the cross, all they do is blind us and leave us condemned. We know the law is holy. We see this in Romans 7. And it's a guide for sanctifying the believer, but by itself, it will do nothing for us. Believe us in our pride. Everything God has created is good, and all good gifts come from heaven, including understanding. But without the cross, these gifts become like drugs, only to lead us down a path of addiction and hurts. Likewise, God does not desire that we're dumb fools, making thinking and wisdom essential to what we actually need to do to understand. He gives us this gift of understanding, and we need to look through the lens of the cross with our understanding. Otherwise, we'll be arrogant, blind, and full of pride. This means that Depending on our definition of speculation, not all of it is in vain. In fact, Luther himself would have to do some thinking and speculation to come up with these theses. But God gives us this mind to think and encourages it, but only encourages it through the light of the cross and His grace, when we're still utterly in despair of what we can do in comparison to what He has. So, after understanding a full picture of Luther's theology of the cross, a Christian must wrestle with some major implications, and I'd like to draw three here today. Instead of speculating on God's invisible characteristics and shaping our lives based on it, on our intellect and our works, we must see life through the suffering of the cross, and I know I've said it many times. If we embrace the devastating effects of our original sin, we can actually accept God's grace and see clearly through that. Progression in a Christian spiritual formation cannot be had in works of the law, 
or speculations of man, which is the way of the theologian of glory. Instead, the Christian must follow the steps of Jesus, who suffered and died for mankind. And the fullness of the cross as a visible self-revelation of God is the only lens we can see God through. So here's my three implications on spiritual formation. First, Christians are called to death and suffering. Second, Christians are called to pursue simplicity, not blessings and glory. And third, Christians are called to a life of faith and worship. So first let's discuss the call to die. The believer's life is not, or is a call not to just endure suffering, but to in fact embrace it just as Christ did, even to the point of death. This is not to say that suffering is blessing in itself, and in fact putting that type of falsehood, saying that suffering is actually a blessing, could be considered a theology of glory. We must see things how they actually are. Not avoiding suffering, but knowing it is never good and is still painful. And even though it's real, painful, and is still considered suffering in this definition, Jesus Christ embraced it, so should we. This suffering brings man to humility that is needed to see Christ clearly, which we saw back in Thesis 18. The life of suffering then goes further than just beginning humility, but it's actually a lifetime of reality and seeing clearly. As stated before, a theologian of the cross sees the world how it actually is, and not how it isn't in the speculation. We see, as a theologian of the cross, the suffering that all creation must endure, and we can't miss it. Further, a correct understanding of God's hidden revelation of the cross links man to God himself. This allows a Christian to walk through all types of suffering, even when it doesn't make sense, and still have hope in the resurrection to come, but knowing this life is orientated towards this suffering. Suffering is also, according to Luther, God's foremost tool as an operation in the sinner. When we suffer all types of things, not just physical suffering like Jesus did on the cross, God puts man out of control. When man is out of control, he is vulnerable, and God can work with him and chisel him. And the theologian of the cross accepts this plight to them and allows them to be vulnerable to God, actually submitting to him in this. Scripture also speaks highly of suffering as a Christian in the light of the cross. 1 Peter 2, 20-25 talks about Christians receiving beatings for the suffering they're doing. This is a Christian's call because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example of following in his footsteps. When Jesus was insulted, he didn't retaliate. The scripture tells us he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. The theologian of the cross entrusts himself to God and follows in the suffering footsteps of Jesus, knowing there's better things to come. So while in this life we must embrace suffering for the kingdom, if we are truly to be a follower of Christ. My second point is the cross actually kills the American dream. Christians in light of the cross are not to pursue blessings and glory in life. And one of the biggest problems, I believe, plaguing the American church is the American dream. It's a dream of control, comfort, and security. And it calls a person to live comfortably as a good citizen of the United States, finding status and recognition in business, religious works, and other things of that sort. People want to live a blessed life but don't know what true blessings are, so they accumulate earthly goods and wisdom and call that blessing. When we look at the big picture, the American dream and the theology of glory, are actually quite similar. They both chase after self-serving deeds, looking for knowledge on how to live, but looking in the wrong places. The theologian of the cross, however, looks to the suffering of the cross for knowledge and finds all these selfish pursuits killed in light of it. The life of Christ led looked the opposite of what the American dream or a chase for glory would look like. Jesus was God, yet he didn't demand that same thing. Jesus had that power, but he lived as a human. He lived a life of sacrificial giving of his time and himself ultimately, never accumulating things for himself. If we are Christians are supposed to look more like Christ, a lot changes in our pursuits. Some will question if this would call the Christian to the extremes of poverty or monasticism. Both, in my opinion, would be more godly routes than the heart of the American dream. But I don't think we can argue those two extremes either for two reasons. One, poverty is brokenness resulting from the fall, and it's actually something we need to escape and help those in poverty. And monasticism is an escape from the world we were called to be a community with salt and light, according to Matthew 5. 
So what it does do is call us to a life of simplicity and giving. Proverbs 38 through 9 shows this balance quite well, I believe. It says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. The Christian is to live with what is necessary and give with the rest that is given to him. This is an extreme call, but I believe is something we are to embrace. The final call on spiritual formation that I draw from Luther's Theology of the Cross is that we are to live a life of faith and worship. The theologian of the cross knows that two things cannot be separated from a relationship with God, and that is faith and worship. We are humble to the point of despair, accepting God's grace, realizing we can't do anything without Him. The motive to worship is God Himself. And since He is the one who initiates to draw us into fellowship with Him, since creatures cannot reach God, God must lower Himself to reach us. And that's from Dennis Nguyen. He reaches man through the cross of Christ, which doesn't make sense to the theologian of glory because God is hidden under things that don't look like the invisible things that are evident to us about God. To them, Christ's suffering does not look like a God that's deserving of worship. But to the theologian of the cross, they know that you must have faith in how God chose to reveal himself, and this faith is the means of our salvation. His faith leads him to worship, and as one cannot worship without faith, the theologian of glory, speculation and doubt leads him to idolatry. And that's where the two paths lead. I think Romans 12, 1 through 2 gives us a fuller picture of what worship would look like to a theologian of the cross. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So a life of worship is characterized by a life of sacrifice in light of God's mercy he showed us on the cross. So, in conclusion, the theologian of the cross sees clearly what Christ has done for us and receives God's grace by being humbled through suffering and lives a life of faith, not sight, so he can see God through his hidden revelation. And he knows that all good within him is only by the power of God. Like all good theology, the theology of the cross should end in doxology or worship. But it is not truly theology unless it is rooted in the visible self-revelation of God and the suffering servant of Jesus Christ, who is our example, our Savior, and our King. We must be theologians of the cross and not theologians of the Lord. listening to another episode of the sermon archives from william r horn make sure you subscribe rate review and check us out on youtube follow your boy on twitter at william r horn h-o-r-n-e and check us out at kingdomdreamer.com